Okay, so let's start. So we are doing conservation of momentum and the math is quite easy. So I'm not going to go over all those problems that you have here, but in the share folder, you have the videos and you can always find YouTube video, you know, for example, the organic chemistry tutor that take you step by step, but it's quite easy. In all those problems, all you have to do is you write down the equation for conservation of momentum and momentum is always conserved, not kinetic energy, but momentum, yes. So you have the total momentum before equals total momentum after, okay? And you have to be very careful. The first thing you want to do is to decide which way is negative and which way is positive. So the only way you can get it wrong is to forget that velocities are vectors, so they can be negative if it's moving to the left, for example, if you have decided that left is negative. Right, so that's the only, only reason. Um, so for, for example, now if you have heat and stick, this is called a totally, completely inelastic collision, heat and stick. So that will be an example when you have two train, for example, and uh, two, two wagon and, and they collide with each other. It could be head on or it could be like one is moving in this direction, the other one is moving in that direction, but maybe this one is moving not as fast, okay? So this one will catch up on that one. Here they collide with each other. You have to be very careful that in that case, remember this one here would be negative. And then they stick to each other, so they're gonna have the same speed after they collide, V prime. So heat and stick, you have M1 V1 plus M2 V2, and then they collide with each other, so that means they, and it's a heat and stick, so it means they, they are glued to each other. So after, you're gonna have M1 plus M2 V prime. Okay, so we did a, a lot of examples in, in the homework, so that's not hard. So that would be heat and stick. You also have the situation when you have a recoil situation. So typically you have two ice skaters, for example. So bef before they do not have speed and they push on each other. One will go with a speed V2 prime. The other one is gonna recoil with V1 prime. This one has a mass M1, this one has a mass M2. So remember there is a special equation in that case. So before no, nothing is moving and then they're pushing on each other. So you have this equation here for a recoil situation, right? Recoil situation could be also a gun, is a typical example, okay? If uh, so someone is the person who came this morning and didn't find me is here, no? It's just that I had to run to my, uh, I, I forgot my computer. Yes. V1? V1. V1 will be the velocity of object one. Here? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that means after. It's a prime. It's a prime. Uh, you don't have to write, okay, in your book, in your book they will write initial, initial, and then uh, uh, and then here uh, uh, you have final and and final. So for me the prime means final after. Okay, so that will be uh, uh, v. I don't know. You don't know prime. Maybe it's a French stuff. The prime. So v one final, v two final, v v two initial, and. Uh, Okay, did I answer your question? Okay, so very quickly, example of recoil here. And again, all those problems should be in the Dropbox. And again, if you need more practice, all you have to do, YouTube, you know, 
conservation of momentum problems, you know, you have tons of videos. It's just algebra. So no, nothing hard. So here we have a recall situation. You have a wagon with a little girl. So before, uh, nothing is moving. The little girl, I'm going to call her uh, object number two. The wagon, I'm going to call it object number one. So of course, she has a mass M2 and it has a mass M1. And you see that before, nothing is moving. After she jumped, and I'm sure you have as a kid experienced that, you jump out of a boat or, or, or uh, ice skate, not ice skate, what's it called? Um, something with wheels here. Huh? Something like this where people they skateboard. skateboard. Thank you. Or, or surfing will be a good idea. Okay, you jump from that, and that is gonna oh. recoil back. So there is always like, especially if you are on a boat, what's gonna happen? You you don't expect the boat to to recoil back, so you can end up in the water. Or if you do like kayak, uh, uh, kayak, like you can do uh, at Olita Olita Park. Okay. So this one is going to move forward, and this one will be backward, OK? So it's a recoil situation. It's like the wagon is burping out the little girl, and that's going to uh, move back depending on, on the speed. So I, I'm going to call that V2, I don't know, if you don't like prime, V2 final, and this one will be V1 final. It's a recoil situation. So that means before is zero, after it's going to be M1 V1 final plus M2 V2 final. Okay, and then I have to be very careful to decide that, for example, left is negative, right is positive. Um, giving the wagon a kick. So it's the wagon that goes at 3.8. 8 meter per second. So the final velocity for the wagon is minus negative 3.8 meter per second. Is that clear? And then it's super easy. There is nothing special here. The wagon is 20 uh, minus 3.8 plus little girl 20 times V V to final. Okay, so it's very easy. All those problems, just algebra, you always apply the same uh, equation. Have to be very careful that left is negative plus. I, since it's a recoil situation, I could have taken a shortcut. I, I could have taken that shortcut here. That means if your grandma is twice as big as you are, you're going to recoil half as fast, OK? Or if grandma ate a lot of Christmas cookies three times your weight, she's going to come. I mean, she's going to move three times less, OK? Not, not as fast as you are. So that's a recoil situation. OK, so that's why I showed you a video last time with a magnum, I think it's called. It's a small gun. So because it's a small gun, you expect a lot of recoil. That's why you have to anchor yourself to the earth to increase the mass of the earth to your own mass. OK, let's take a, a quick, another quick example here. But it's always the same. Uh, and if, if the person, I'm very sorry for the person who was waiting for me before, I had to run home. I forgot my computer home. And without my computer, I cannot do anything. OK, so the first thing you want to do in physics here, uh, in those situations, you decide which way is plus, which one is minus. First step. Step number two, you have to do a drawing. So you have a basketball. So you draw your basketball. That's a basketball. And you call that thing number one, so that will be thing number one, and it has a mass. The mass is uh, 1.2 kilogram, traveling at 7.5 meter per second, so it's traveling here, so V 
1 equals 7.5. I'm being very careful with the sign. It's a positive sign because it's moving to the right. Hits the back of a 12 kilogram. Okay, so in my head I say, okay, the mass here is multiplied by 10. So I'm going to call that number 2, thing number 2, 12 kilogram. That will be thing number 2. So that's going to be before, before. And um, okay, we suppose that um, the thing here is not moving is at rest. So it's not moving. So I'm going to write down V2 equals 0. Okay, so little by little you read over the problem and you report all the information on your drawing. Whatever science, even if you do computer science, you know you always do drawing. It really, really helps. So it's going to bounce back, bouncing back. Um, okay, it says it's bouncing back, and if you don't like prime, I'm not going to put prime, but because it's bouncing back, you have to be very careful here to put a negative, negative 8 meter per second. Uh, 12 and bounces off at uh, oh, V1, that's what you say. Thank you. Okay, the drawing is good, but it's a V1. So V1F, so bounce back, sending the wagon off. So, of course, you know, your guts, of course, your guts tells you that it's going to go in this direction, but not as fast. So momentum, momentum has been transferred from the basketball to the wagon, but the wagon has more mass, so most of its momentum that is gaining from the momentum of the basketball is going to go to its mass. But the momentum transfer is the same, okay? So that means the momentum from the basketball will be equals to the momentum gained by the wagon. Again, that's a consequence of Newton's third law. You cannot hit without being hit, and you cannot hit more than, than, than you are being hit. Okay, so for every action, you have a reaction. And the conservation of momentum means that we neglect any friction happening into the system. So here you have the system, the wagon, the basketball. We neglect all, all the friction happening because it happens during a very short time. Is that clear? Are you with me? So then I just have to write always the same story, no things like algebra one, like very basic algebra, momentum before equals momentum after. I like to put a prime, but someone doesn't like it, so I'm not going to put a prime anymore. So just final, and that will be initial. So thing number one was uh, has a mass of 1.2, a speed of 7.5, plus thing number two is not moving at all, so I put a zero here, equals here, that's where you can do a mistake. That's the only way you can mess up with those problems, is to um, forget that velocity is a vector. So thing number one, 1.2, and here you have a minus 3.8. If you don't put a minus here, when it's going to go on the other side, it's going to be minus. Whereas if you put a minus here, when it goes on the other side, it's going to be a plus. So the, the danger is that you're going to add instead of subtracting or subtracting instead of adding. That's the only way you can mess up. Otherwise, it's very easy. So 12 times v to final, and you can solve for the final velocity. Is that clear? And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a heat. Here we have a heat and, and merge, and I did those problems already. So again, you have a lot of, uh, for example, a, a good uh, channel is called the uh, Organic Chemistry Tutor, and he goes about uh, through very basic, basic problems like those. Or it's called another one is called Physics Ninja, also very basic, not basic, but it, it takes you step by step. And in my 
share folder. I have all those videos. If you need help, I'm here after. I'm sorry I was not here before. I forgot my computer. It took me one hour to go back home and come back. Sorry. Okay, ballistic pendulum. Very good. Interesting. Because it goes into three steps. One step, two step, three step. So between step one and step two, I cannot use conservation of mechanical energy. I cannot use that because you see here it has, so this one has no kinetic energy. This one has kinetic energy. What's going to happen to that kinetic energy is going to be turned here into, of course, some kinetic energy here, all right, but also into friction. So if you want to hide conservation of energy, energy is always conserved, but some of it goes into heat, and we don't have an equation for heat. Heating, right? When rubbing, when you, you rub your hand, you see I have kinetic energy, and all that kinetic energy goes into heating my hand. I don't have a formula for that. I don't know. Yeah, I will have to do some uh, chemistry with a calorie meter and stuff like that. But I don't know how much energy is being lost to heat. So yes, of course, here, kinetic energy one from the bullet equals kinetic energy two from the block and the bullet plus whatever is lost to heat. And I do not know. So from here to there, you cannot use conservation of energy. You can always use conservation of momentum. And then from here to there, it's not a collision anymore. It's not I push you, then you push me. Okay, so there is no exchange in uh, momentum here. From here to there, yes, you can use conservation of energy because all that kinetic energy goes into potential energy. Is that clear? So it's a three steps problem, typical, like any physics book, textbook, you know, you, you will have those problems. The, the ballistic pendulum, uh, that, that's what they used back then to find the speed of a bullet, right? Before the high speed photography, ballistic pendulum, that's, that's what they used. I think it's still used today, I don't know. Okay, so let's, let's do this one. So first thing, um, so one way to do it, so phase one, here you have conservation of momentum between here and there. And then between here and there, you have conservation of energy. Is that clear? First step in science, you understand what's going on. Second step, you decide of a strategy. A good strategy is, is to go backward. Okay, so here, from here to there, you have conservation of potential energy. And by the way, if you want to go very quick with the homework, if you just have kinetic energy equals potential energy, you have this equation. Okay, remember, because mgh equals 0 0.5 mv squared, and then you can cross out here, and v equals square root of 2gh. So that, that will take a shortcut. So anyway, so in that case, I'm not going to take a shortcut because I don't want to panic anyone. Um, so the mass of the block is... 2.5, the mass of the bullet is 0 0.01. So I'm going to go from here to there. I'm going to go backward. Are you with me, guys? So conservation of energy. Here I just have kinetic energy equals potential energy. Have to decide where the potential energy equals zero. Of course, I'm going to pick the easiest way for me is to take the potential energy equals zero here. So kinetic energy here is 0 0.5 m1 plus m2 v square equals m, m1 plus m2, it's one system, g, g times, times the height. And look what's going to happen. I don't have to worry about the mass. That's what I was telling you here. And I can say v, the velocity, equals the square root of 2gh. Are you with me on that? Because boom, boom. Cancel out, right? 
always when you have potential kinetic only involved you can cross out the mass so that's going to be square root i'm going to take g to be 10 times 0 0.650 and then i take my calculator and uh, i don't know who came today to see me but after i am available okay again i'm sorry i apologize i forget if I don't forget my head, that's a good thing. I just forget my computer. 3.6, did you get that? So that velocity here is 3.6. Yes? Yes, everyone? Okay. And then I go back. I go back in, in between this situation here and that situation there. Okay, so that's heat, stick, and stick. Heat and stick means it's totally inelastic. Not totally inelastic, but that means the energy, the kinetic energy is not totally conserved because, because of friction. Friction is involved. So heat and stick and they move together with the same speed. Yes? And we know that this is 3.6. And what else do we know? We know that M1 is 2.5 and M2 is 0 0.01 kilogram. Let me check. Yes. So before equals after. First thing, Right is plus, is plus, left is minus. So before, I'm going to have M1, V1 plus M2, V2 equals V1, V final plus M2, V final. And here, it's a heat and stick. So I have heat and stick, they go together. So of course, the final velocity for one equals the final velocity for two is just the final velocity. Yes, are you with me? Any question? So, V sub one, that's what I want actually. Okay, so, V M one, so that would be thing number one, it's my bullet. So, 0 0.01 times my unknown plus the mass. So oh, M1, we say it's the bullet, sorry. M1 is the projectile. So here, 0 0.01 kilogram. So if I stick to here, right? So this is the bullet. That's the block. It's, uh, the block is not moving, so I put a 0 equals the bullet here, 0 0.01 final. And they are moving together. I don't know why I cannot. I'm stuck somewhere. Plus uh, 2.5 V final. Is that clear? Yes, everyone? So 0 0.01 V1 equals, you combine like terms. I used to teach algebra. So that's called combining like terms. So 0 uh, 2.51. Make sure I don't do any mistake. Is that right or uh, 2.51, right? Um, uh, I hope. Oh, uh, and we have final. We say it's 3.6. So V1 equals 2.51 times 3.6. And whatever you find, you're going to multiply by 100. Because when you divide by 0 0.01, it's like multiplying by 100. about 900 is that clear it's a typical um, speed for a bullet it's called a ballistic uh, pendulum any question huh yes don't be shy and here they go step by step. So I'm curious, so I look it up. 
a typical speed for a bullet is 1800 miles per hour so it goes faster than the speed of sound that's why it makes a boom sonic boom when you shoot goes faster than the speed of light not light sound nothing can go faster than the speed of light sorry are you with me okay good and uh, I'm available after, okay? I really feel bad that I say 9.45, whoever that was. And, and I realized I forgot my computer. I had to go back home, take the car, and I'm not a good driver. And people are very bad drivers also, so I fit in. Okay, so very important here, what we call a elastic collision. Elastic collision means no kinetic energy is lost. So before and after, I'm going to have the same kinetic energy. So that means I can write an equation. Kinetic energy before equals kinetic energy after. So in that case, you see that kinetic energy goes into potential elastic energy. That means the ball here is made of rubber, so all that kinetic energy is going to be stored into um, squeezing the ball. It's like a, a spring. But you remember, spring, spring force is a conservative force. That means it will give back whatever it has in storage. So all that kinetic energy goes into storing uh, uh, store elastic potential energy and then it gives back the kinetic energy here and then it, it gives back the potential energy so it goes from potential gravitational potential kinetic before it hits the floor then elastic potential energy then kinetic again then potential again is that clear in the real life that, that does not happen some of it will be lost to heat I noise 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 is a form of energy when you make noise it's a sound wave and any wave will carry energy with it so it makes a noise you are losing energy heating up the floor okay so you don't get back the same kinetic energy this is called the inelastic collision and then if it's Instead of having a basketball, you have a tomato, smash, splash, okay, everything is lost. So we call that completely inelastic collision. It's a type of collision that you hit and stick. So here it's sticking with the earth, okay, so all the momentum lost is going into the mass of the earth. However, the momentum is always conserved. Momentum is always conserved. Except here you have the Earth, and the Earth is so big, it's not going to move very much. Momentum is always conserved unless you have a significant friction happening over a, a long time. Kinetic energy is not always conserved. Is that clear? So, elastic collision means kinetic energy is conserved typical uh, you, you you play pool you have a cue ball and maybe here you have the eight ball so it's going to hit this one this one is going to stop this one is going to move with the same velocity as that one before it makes sense right you ask your gut your guts had played pool before it knows that in that case it's a perfectly elastic collision all the kinetic energy before equals the kinetic energy after and because they have the same mass this one has to stop you can have an elastic collision this way so they bounce back they exchange the momentum but of course the velocity here will be the same or you can have this situation all those situations are elastic potential uh, elastic collision is that clear Okay, so there is a secret that can give you shortcut when solving elastic collision. 
when kinetic energy is conserved. There is a secret. I'm, I'm going to tell you the secret. Ready for the secret? So first of all, you, you can do the math. When you have an elastic collision, then that means that the total momentum before equals the total momentum after. And no prime here. You see V1F and V2F. And you also have the equation that the total kinetic energy before, so kinetic energy of this one plus kinetic energy of that one equals to the total kinetic energy after. If you take those two equations and you massage and you shake and, and um, you solve, that's, that's what you will get. It comes to two simple equations. It comes to the equation total momentum before equals total momentum after, but it also comes to the following equation, which means that in an elastic collision, in an elastic collision, the relative speed stays the same. Okay, so the, the with a minus if it's velocity. So I'm going to give you an example, and you're going to exactly understand what I mean. This is my favorite example. You can make a video about that. You take a basketball and a ping pong ball. I showed you the video last time, right? You drop it from the same height. So they both have the same potential energy. Then they're going to speed up. All, all that energy is going to turn into the same kinetic energy if we neglect friction. The basketball is bouncing off first, and it has a huge mass. So that means before, we're going to have that. So let me ask you something. If this is one meter per second, say, and this one is one meter per second, what's going to be the relative speed? So it means someone, is it, is it going to be less time or more time if someone comes toward me? Less time, right? So it's like having more speed, yes? So what's going to be the relative speed? Two meters per second. It will be zero if I move at 20 miles per hour, and the car in front of me is moving at two meters per hour as well, right? So the distance between us is not changing. So from my point of view, the car in front of me is not moving. So the relative speed is zero. But if we, if we go head-on, like it happens a lot in Miami, you know, head-on collision, you, you, you have to add the speed. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Relative. Hmm? Relative. Yeah. relative. The relative speed. So from the point of view, if you are standing here, or if an unfortunate bug is standing on the basketball, definitely very bad for it, because it's going to meet faster. Right? So from the perspective of a bug here, that ball is moving at twice the speed. So two meters per second. Is that clear? So this one is bouncing off, almost not slowing down because it has a huge mass. So most of its momentum goes into the mass. And this one is zoom. You can do the experiment. You can make a video and send me the video. How fast is it going to go? If this was one, this is one, the relative speed is two, and this one doesn't slow down, it's still one, how fast this one has to go? Three, because three minus one is two. Does it make sense? If, if someone is moving at 60 miles per hour in front of me, I am moving at 20 miles per hour. I'm trying to catch it up, catch up on, on that car, but not quite. So my, my, my relative speed, from my point of view, the speed is 40. It's moving away from me at 40 miles per hour. Does it make sense? So the relative speed now is still 2. So this one has to go 3. But you see that the relative speed is still the same, except that it's moving in the opposite direction. Yes. So the relative speed is, you know, between objects, like, average, 
So if if it's here, if it's if if it's add on, you add. If one, if you are, if they are moving in the same direction, you subtract. Make sense? So if a pair is moving at 60, and I'm not moving, from my perspective, it's 60. But if I'm moving at 20, and this one is moving at 60, I'm, I'm getting closer, right? So then you have to do 60 minus 20, right? So the relative speed is still 2. In, in the opposite direction. So this one has to go at three. Does it make sense? So if I ask you for test number three, you will know how to answer. The relative speed here is still two. This one has to go three times as fast. Is that clear? So let me ask you something. If this one goes three times as fast, typical equation on the test, if the speed is multiplied by 3, the kinetic energy will be multiplied by 9. It goes with the square, right? That's why kinetic energy kills. That's what killed the dinosaur 65 million years ago. All that kinetic energy from the meteorite, that was a huge meteorite, boom, goes into sanding dust into the sky, and it was a winter nuclear winter if you want, so the sun will not um, shine and blah, blah, blah. So anyway, kinetic energy kills. Nine times the kinetic energy that it had before. So what's going to happen to the height? All that kinetic energy will turn into height, into potential energy. So the height will be multiplied by nine. Okay, because all that kinetic energy goes to height, potential energy. Kinetic energy, potential energy. Nine times the kinetic energy, nine times the potential energy. Potential energy is proportional to height, so nine times as high. Got me? Isn't that interesting? So a lot of applications. So for example, if you have a supernova, a supernova happens when all that material falls on a star and bounces off crazy and you have a thermonuclear weapon then everything is destroyed and here you have a neutron star left behind this is called the crab nebula and there is a great astronomy class if you want to take as an elective next semester and you will learn about the crab nebula but that's my point here so all that comes from massaging those two equations here. Conservation of momentum, always true. Conservation of kinetic energy, only true if the collision is elastic, right? You massage and you shake, right? It's really, really hard. It's very simple algebra. And you get that final answer, which is the relative velocity before equals minus the relative velocity after. Minus because they, they bounce off. So that's a shortcut for elastic potential, uh, elastic collision. Is that clear? Now, if, uh, if you want to do all the math, and massage, and, and uh, I'm not going to do all the math and all the steps. So that's the equation that you get for an elastic collision. When you have an elastic collision, oh, you see here they use a prime. So that will be the velocity after for object number two, velocity after for object number one, when you have an elastic collision. You can do the math. In case of the basketball and the ping pong, that means that the mass one here for the basketball is very, 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 very large relative to the ping pong. And then you, you, you can play with those equations. And what you get is that after the collision, the ping pong has the same velocity about 
because it has so much mass that more most of its gain if momentum goes to its mass and the ping pong has to go at three times the speed nine times the kinetic energy nine times the height okay you, you can do some uh, calculus not even calculus right it's algebra you see that when the mass is really big here this one disappear so you're gonna have a two this one disappear this one is gonna disappear this one is a minus so it's gonna be a plus one two plus one is three and then m1 is really big so that goes away m1 is very big m1 is very big those goes away and you have v, v1 prime equals v1 okay very, very simple math is that clear now uh, typical equation or, or situation you see this comes here so they do have a relative speed so what do you do in that case to find the relative speed between this one and that one do you subtract or they add they go in the same direction S uh, subtract very good you subtract so then in between you know all that kinetic energy that you had before goes into elastic potential energy and then it's going to bounce up now all the kinetic energy is conserved why is it conserved because you remember this is elastic potential energy so it's conservative so it means everything you're going to put in will be burped out again it's not going to be lost so between here and there we can say kinetic energy is conserved so that means the relative speed will be the same and that gives you a shortcut to solve those kind of problem so with those kind of problem you will say we know that this one is moving at that this one is moving at this uh, this one is bouncing back at that and find the speed here is that clear so you have to skip from here to there in the meantime you see that spring is going to be compressed when it's going to be maximum compression they're going to move together so that you can find the maximum compression here by saying all that kinetic energy you had before goes into elastic potential energy plus kinetic energy of the two blocks so I to, to have a if you want really your gut to learn about collision, you have to go into bumper cars. I loved that when I was a kid. I was crazy about them. But you know that when you you hit another car, for one moment you're gonna move together. Isn't that as when you are glued together, you're gonna move together. Is that is that true? You move together you have the same speed and then you bounce up so same thing here when it's going to be heat they're going to move together with the same speed before it's going to burp out this one so it works like here you have to do bumper car to understand collision so if two car collide let's say head on for one moment they're going to move together and then it's going to be bouncing up so that's how you can solve those kind of problems any question and then this uh, you have also two dimensional collision so then even though it's elastic say it's elastic there is no shortcut you cannot say that the relative speed is the same before and after you cannot even say along the x and along the y it's gonna, no it doesn't work anymore you just you are stuck with equations to solve and but that's fine because you have your ti so how do we solve 2d problem all you have to do is like we did for projectile motion you do uh, two two uh, colon one for the x component one for the y component so momentum before along the x equals momentum after along the y is that clear <coughs> so in that case you see do, do you have anything happening along the y before no so we we can say that before here the total momentum along the y-axis equals zero which means there which means that if this one is going into one direction 
the other one has to go in another direction such as when you add this momentum along the y plus that momentum along the y it has to be zero is that clear so that means that m1 v1 y plus m2 v2 y has to be equal to zero in that case, that just means that angle here has to be 90 degrees, only in that situation. But you see how it's solved. That's why I told you that when you have a nuclear, nuclear um, reaction, like you are going for a PET scan, PET scan in, inside you, you have like some nuclear reaction burping out gamma rays from inside out, inside out, inside out. One gamma ray goes in this direction, the other gamma ray has to go in the opposite direction. So momentum is conserved, right? And you are highlighted from inside out. So this is all math, and uh, I'm not going to do that because it's annoying, it's just math. Uh, you can have also, you can just take your textbook, any video on YouTube again will take you step by step, just math, okay? It's not even, once you understand the conservation of momentum, that's not physics anymore, just math and trick. A collision in 2D, it could be also, so if it's elastic, you have to use conservation of kinetic energy before and after, even in two dimension. It could be non-elastic, so heat and stick. It's a typical situation. And you can work for a lower, lower firm, a low firm, right? And, and you, you, you can do the math here if you are a physics major to see if they are lying or not. Because for instance, it's going to be a big deal. If you are lying about your speed, you are going over the speed limit, then they can find you and you can be in trouble, right? So you will have to write here conservation of energy before equals conservation of energy after. You see, for energy, kinetic energy, you have to use the speed. There is no component. Okay? It's the speed. Remember, when you are writing kinetic energy, is a scalar and you are using the speed. So you have to take the speed of one square plus the speed of the other one square equals speed after of number one square plus the speed after number two square with the, the mass, of course. So you have three equations, three equations to deal with. Okay, so you have this equation plus that equation plus, plus, I'm going to write it down just to make sure you understand. So that's two equations, plus, 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 plus kinetic energy before, only if it's uh, elastic, right? Only for elastic. So that will be 0 0.5 m1 v1 square. There is no more components because kinetic energy, you need the speed. So v2 square equals 0 0.5 m1 v1 F square plus 0 0.5 M2 V2 <coughs> F square. And remember that V1, V1, for example, is a velocity here. It has a X component and it has a Y component. And here, to find the kinetic energy, I need to use the magnitude here, the, the hypotenuse. Yes? I didn't lose anyone. Okay, cool. Now, the test three is on first day. And um, it's on first day. It should be an hour and a half. But I let open, I let it open for hours if, uh, if you have conflict or whatever.
Indianapolis. I don't know anyone in Indianapolis. Okay, so we're going to talk about talks now. It's a lot of uh, applications for people going into civil engineering or mechanical engineering. So you have two types of motion. You have translation, and then here we have rotation. So if you want to have something spin, you need to apply a torque. So for example, if, if I have a door, there is a door over there. Can I go to the door? Can you see me over there, like very far away? Can you see me here? So this is the axis of rotation. Here we have an axis of rotation. And I want the, the door is not uh, moving. I want to start the door uh, to move. So what do I need for that? How efficient I'm going to be in making the door uh, moving? So I, you need what? First, you need to apply a force. Very good. Force acceleration. Change in the state of motion. However, if I push here, is, is it is it efficient? No. no. I have to move, I have to push where? Here. As far as possible. So not only the force matters, but also the distance between the place where I apply the force and the axis of rotation. Yeah? So the distance matters. Right? What else? If if I if I pull here, is it, is it helping? If I, no. not helping. No. So what, what is it? How, how can I be as efficient as possible? If you look at the orientation, I have to be perpendicular. Like a perpendicular. So three things, force, distance, orientation. So I have to introduce a new physical quantity. We, we call that the torque. That torque will provide an angular acceleration. So if I push, the door will start to move faster. And inside that torque, I need to include a direction, a distance, and a force. So for that, I need to go to calculus three and to define a new way to multiply vectors. So we know the dot product when we define the work, it's the force times the distance with a dot is a scalar product. Now I have to define something else. I'm not going to go into details because it's not a math class. What we call that the cross product. That's the tool that we need to use to define this new physical quantity, okay? So here is my example. This is the door. This is the axis of rotation. This is perfect. So you see there is a reason why the, the door knob <laughs> is not here or is not there. It has to be as far as possible from the axis of rotation. If I push here, okay, I have to push harder then I push there. So it's like a machine. If I want to multiply my effort, I have to push as far as possible from here. Yes? Orientation matters. If I, if I push in this direction, it's not going to be very helpful. See how it works? So for example, very easy. Um, the best, the easiest way in that situation you see that the torque will be just, so you see, you see in physics, when they try to define physical quantity, they just try to multiply or divide, and then they can uh, put some sine and cosine and exponent. But here it's very simple. The force is perpendicular. This is the axis of rotation. So you just multiply the force by the distance between where the force is applied and the axis of rotation. Yeah? Make sense? So there is a reason why we have range. The bigger the range, 
very good, right? So, for example, here you, you want to have a large, like a long range, right? So it will make your job easier. Yeah. So what you should do first is the time. Okay, so what do you think? Uh, remember, uh, warp was what times what? Force times distance. So now torque replace force. So if you have to have the work, you have to multiply by the distance. But distance in that case will be the angle, the angle, right? So the work done, when I push that door, will be the torque multiplied by the angular, angular. very good, angular displacement, right? So torque, torque is like force. It's the same thing, but you have to multiply by the distance. I mean, by the angular displacement to have the work. And of course, there is a price to pay if you are stronger. If you are stronger, I mean, that will make you stronger if you have a long range. What's the price to pay? Very good. You have to go through a very long distance when the thing here, what it's called, the bolt will move a tiny bit. So same, always the same thing because of conservation of energy. So torque multiplied by the angle. If 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 you get stronger, if it's a torque multiplier, then the angle has to be bigger there is a price to pay it's a trade-off right it's like in medicine they forget but it's supposed to have a trade-off between risk and benefit so same thing here there is a trade-off between the force and and the distance for which you have to go is that clear so in that case the force is the same is is the torque the same now no, so which which one will provide the largest torque? The, the big one, right? So twice the distance, twice the torque. Make you twice as strong. Here, that's called the lever type one. You have the load. And where do you think you have to push? C. C, very good, right? C, because that's the fulcrum. Here, that's the fulcrum, the axis of rotation, that's your load. If the distance here is 1, and that distance here is 1, 2, 3, 4, it makes you 4 times stronger. So if you can provide only 20 pound push, you can lift 80 pound. Of course, you have to push over four times the distance relative to the load. So this is called the effort that's going to be called the load. Orientation matters. So which one do you think is uh, more efficient? Air, right? Perpendicular. So because it's perpendicular, let's take an example here. So you have different ways to find to, to find the torque, and then I will give you the, the, ma the math. So you have a force here, 100 Newton. The force has two components. Remember, to find the component, you go, uh, you, you find, you go from the tail to the head. So that will be like your parallel component, and this one will be the perpendicular component. We can do this one. Are you agree with me? Do you agree with me? So which one is doing the work? The perpendicular. So that one, yes? So we can see that the torque will be the perpendicular component times the distance between here and there. So between the fulcrum or the axis of rotation to the point of application, yes? So that would be um, R, I'm going to call that R, or, or the distance 
the distance between the force and the fulcrum. So the torque, and by the way, torque is a Greek letter, it's called tau. This is a Greek letter, it's called tau. Equals, so the perpendicular, and, and this is 100, that will be the magnitude. Is it the cosine or, or the sine? Do you all agree with that? Yes. What's your name? Isara. Yes. Tell me your name so I remember. It's hard. I have 70, uh, 72 students. No, 74. Although not everyone is here, of course. So anyway. Huh? I, I, I don't. I, I know he's Raphael. <laughs> Is is Isaiah? Is Sarah? And then uh, I, this guy over there is uh, Stephen, and 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 Sam, Sam and and Pedro because he asks a lot of questions and Deirdre because she has red hair, and um, Adrian over there or Brian. I have someone named Adrian who looks like you, and then <coughs> Angela, and then Manuel. And, and then, uh, <laughs> is that, isn't that? Okay. And then uh, 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 Sonia over there. And then, but so, I'm sorry, and that's it. <laughs> See? I have, keep, keep telling me your name and I, I will remember. So 100 cosine 40 times 10. Is that, is that clear? Is that true? Okay, so that will be uh, one way to find the torque. Now, okay, uh, the other way that you might learn from, from, uh, from your book, you, you, you extend, you extend the you extend the line here, you extend the line of the force, right? And then you take your axis of rotation and you project here. That distance here, it's called the lever arm. So if you do mechanical engineer, you, you're going to learn about the lever arm here. So you, you extend here the, the action, the, the line of action it's called. And you project here, it's going to be the lever arm. So I'm going to say the torque equals the lever arm times, times the force. So let's see if it works. <coughs> you see the lever arm is the distance, distance times cosine 40 times the force. So I get exactly the same equation. Do you agree with that? Yes? So it's a different way to do it, to find the lever arm. So you extend the force, you project here, that's called the perpendicular distance. Third way is to use math. So third way is to use what we called the cross product. So the cross product between the force and the distance as vector. You see that vector here? So I'm going to say the cross product between the force and the distance r. So what is that here? It's not a multiplication, it's a cross. So when you have vectors, you have two ways to multiply vectors. You can say a dot b, so this is called the dot product and it has to be a scalar, we've seen that, or you can say a cross b, and that will give you a vector, and this is called the cross product. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. So by definition, the cross product equals the magnitude of f times the magnitude of r times the sine between the force and the distance. So that means you, you take that force, you extend it, and you take that R, you extend it, 
And that will be the angle here, that angle here. And you see that angle here would be the same as cosine 40. Because that's going to be F R sine. That's a 90 degrees plus 40 degrees. So a little bit of geometry. And that will be the cosine 40. So I'm not going to go into calculus too much because that's physics and you can take your calculus free if you want. But just for you to know, you have three ways to do it. Usually we use either the first way with a perpendicular one or the one with the lever arm. Is that clear? So just uh, two minutes, two minutes of math. Uh, how do we find cross product? You have to take your hand, three fingers. Don't want to take one finger, two finger, and you, you want to do the cross product between A and B. So A is in this direction, B is in that direction. The cross product will be the perpendicular to both. By definition, this is called the cross product. So I invite you to go on YouTube or whatever and learn more about the cross product. Vector A, vector B, vector C. Okay, that's called the cross product. The magnitude of that cross product, which is a vector, will be magnitude of A times magnitude of B times the sign between them. Okay, so it means that this angle here does not have to be 90 degrees. That angle here, let's say, let's say this is 60. I'm just taking an example. So the cross product of A and B will be, by definition, the magnitude of A, you know, how much, times the magnitude of B, how much, times the sine between them. And that will be the magnitude of the cross product here. And the direction is given by that. Is that clear? So it's cross product in two minutes. Uh, it, you can also, the same way that when you dot the dot product, you have two ways to define it. You also have two ways for the cross product, and this is the way to go. Okay, so you have to take matrix and the determinant, so that will be how we do it using the matrix method. So again, take your physics book and learn about the cross project. What's going to be relevant for us when we get, I'm hoping that we're going to get to angular momentum. A, B, C. Okay, so that's a cross product. So you see here, you have A, B, the magnitude will be the area, the area of that parallelogram here, and the direction is given by here. Okay? Yeah. Oh, the torque. Okay, so that means I'm, I'm going to show you in a moment. Okay, my point is to find the torque. Okay, to find the torque. If you use the math as a tool, you're going to do the cross product between the distance R and the force L. So that will mean that it's going to be the magnitude of the distance times the magnitude of the force times the sign between them. If you do it according to the definition, the because you, you see, that's the definition of the cross product. So if I, if I do it the way I, I taught you, uh, let's say you don't know the math and you, you didn't take physics uh, calculus 3, you see that F here has two components, the perpendicular one 
and the parallel one. So which one is helping in, uh, this is a door, that's your door, and that's the axis of rotation here. So the torque applied by the force on the door, it's going to be what? Do I, do I use the perpendicular or the parallel one? Perpendicular. This one is just pulling the door away from the hinge, so it's not helping. So the torque will be in magnitude, in magnitude. Perpendicular times the distance r. Yes? So that's going to be, you see, if, if this is the angle theta, that's going to be f sine theta times r. And it just happened that this is the definition of the cross product, f cross r. So we have a tool in mathematics that will give us that computation here. That will be in magnitude. So the unit will be Newton meter. This one is Newton and this one is meters. The sign and the angle the, the angle between R and F. Now, you, you do not need to know that definition because you, you can just use your guts and do the physics. But that's just, I'm trying to connect with calculus 3. Okay? By definition, that will be the definition of a torque. That will be R cross F. So, which way is going your torque now? Take, take your finger. Three fingers. Okay. R F. So the torque is going towards you or into the screen? Towards you. So the torque is actually a vector. Okay, the torque is a vector. Work, when you dot work, you do force dot displacement is a scalar. Torque is a vector. A different way to do it, maybe in your book, they take the right hand, it's called the right hand rule, and they go like this. R, F, thumb. So the thumb would be your vector torque. So the torque is a vector. And why is it important to understand the right hand rule? Because then when we go to conservation of angular momentum or, or, or angular momentum, then you can understand things like counter steering. You know, when you are when you well, doing bike and you want to turn to the right, all you have to do, you lean to the right, and all of a sudden the bike, boom, is turning on its own. Right? Or if you, if you have a bike like this, you push on the left, boom, it's turning to the right. That's why you have so many ac accidents with uh, uh, scooters. They don't understand the uh, what is called gyroscope, gyroscope uh, effect. Do this, boom, it's going to turn in this direction. And for that, you have to understand the cross project. Okay, that was uh, just a parenthesis. Yes. The talk is it uh, test three? Uh, I don't know, I forgot. I don't think so, because we start something new. Okay, I have, I have to go back and check. I totally forgot. Uh, here is a nice example. Take your right hand. Uh, that will be the force. You see, you apply a force. That will be the distance. That will be the distance between the axis of rotation and the point where the, the force is applied, yes? Okay, you connect them together. And with your hand, I'm going to go on that side, that's not fair for everybody. So, this, or you do that, you see that the torque will be in this direction. And it's going to spin like that. It's the direction of the spinning, if you want. So the, the magnitude of the torque will be just the force here times the distance. That's it. Yes? 
So the sign will be the angle between here and there. And uh, it depends which way you are uh, pushing or pulling. So here it's 90. So if it's 90, then the sign is 1. And you are left with torque equals the distance times the force. Okay? It's just a, a new definition. We call that the cross product. It's used a lot in physics and in... Uh, in uh, I don't know mechanical engineer I guess it's it's a cross product. Okay, let's let's go back to something very simple. Uh, this is your door. This is the fulcrum. So this one is maximum, yes or no? Okay, so what's going to be the torque in that case? Twenty. Newton meters, right? In that case, what do you use? Cosine or sine? So F2. Think. So you go from the tail to the head, and which one is really doing the job? Sine. This one is perpendicular, and this one is parallel. That will be the sine doesn't have to be the sign, but in that case, it's the sign. So the torque applied by F2 will be equals to 20 times the sine 30 times 1. And we say that if, if the torque makes a rotation counterclockwise, it's going to be positive. If the torque make it clockwise, the torque is going to be negative. It's just a definition. So this one is doing what? Going this way or going that way? So counterclockwise, so it's going to be positive. Is that clear? What about the torque by F1? Is there a torque? Are, are, are you being efficient? No. So the torque is? Zero. That's it. You are not being efficient. Now you can use the math and you say, okay, the torque equals F, um, F cross R. So it's going to be F R and the sign between F and R. And, and you're going to get the same thing. So where is the torque now? Toward you or into the screen? So we can go this way up. So the third is toward you. Is that clear? Or we can do something like this? The torque is a vector. We're going to do the opposite. <laughs> Towards you, the torque is towards you, right? Or we can do something like this, right? So we can uh, towards you will be a dot. So if I want to represent the, the, the torque, which is a vector, I will put a dot. What about this one? The torque by F sub five. So it has a x component and has a y component. So which one I take, the the y compo the, the, the the parallel component or the perpendicular? Perpendicular here, you see it, it's here. So that's going to be twenty sine in that case times the distance, which is a 0 0.5 newton meters. That's going to be counterclockwise. You see how it works? So you have to be very careful. Uh, textbook, nothing uh, stop you from using the textbook. So which one is uh, the greatest, the largest torque? 
which one will be uh, the, the, the most efficient in, in making the thing rotate about that number? So you, you put here, you, you put a stick or a screwdriver and you want the thing to spin. Which one is the most efficient? Number three, because it's farther away. Number two is zero, not efficient at all. And this one is kind of efficient, but not really. So let's take an example. Here we have a rotation. That's from the muscle. And you have that distance here. You want to find the torque. So you can do it by lever arm or you can do it by perpendicular. So find the torque. So you have the distance. So this is your axis of rotation. That's a hinge. That's your fulcrum. Here you have R, the distance. And you have the force here. And you know that's going to be uh, 55 degrees. And that force is from the muscle, 790 Newton. You have two ways to do it. You can do it through the lever arm. You have to think about it. Or you can find the perpendicular. So the best way to solve those problems is to think of a door. This is a hinge of the door. This is your door here. And you are pulling in this direction. So imagine a door. And this is your door knob. Knob. Door knob. Again, the best way to see, you have your door. My triangle is your fulcrum. And you are pulling on the door knob here, but at an angle. That angle here is 55. So because this is 55, this one has to be 55. So do you use cosine or sine? Cosine here, because you want the perpendicular, OK? This is the perpendicular. That's the one is making. And this is the parallel. Is that clear? So that will be F cosine 55 times the distance. It's a 6. It's not a 5. Yeah? Is that clear? So the best way to do it is uh, using, using uh, uh, imagine a door. Now, the other way to do it is to do it with the lever arm. So this is the force. This is the force. You take your axis of rotation and you find the perpendicular distance here perpendicular distance. So we can also say that the torque equals F times the perpendicular distance. And this is called the level arm. So that's going to be F times L times cosine uh, theta. And you will get the same thing. So sometimes it's better to use a definition with the lever arm. To find the level arm, you extend F, or you have F, and you project here. That distance, perpendicular distance, is called the lever arm. Is that clear? So you have three ways to do it. You can use a definition of a cross product. 
you can find the perpendicular component here, or and you multiply by the distance, or you take the force and you multiply by the lower arm, and you get the same thing. You get that? Okay, so let's try. You start from R, or you can do this, right? What does that tell you? Is it like it's the direction of R? Uh, we, we, we're gonna, s that's a very good question. It's because when we're gonna talk, for example, about, you know how a force will change a direction? So the, 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 the force will change the acceleration, so a torque will do also the same thing. It's gonna change the angular momentum. It's 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 gonna be it's uh, it's gonna be uh, I don't know. It's 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 gonna be the story with with the bicycle. So for example, if you have a rope here and you have like a wheel attached to the rope, of course the wheel you expect the wheel to fall, right? Because of gravity. But if it's spinning, if it's spinning, then you have an angular momentum here, and the torque will change the angular momentum. So uh, the torque will give you which way the angular momentum is going to change, so the, the wheel is going to process. Okay, so the same way that a force change the momentum, the linear momentum, a torque will change the angular momentum. So you have to to know which way the, the torque is pointing, to know which way the angular momentum. So it's a story of a gyroscope. We're going to get to that, I hope, next week. We're going to get to that next week. So knowing the torque, yes, it does matter, <coughs> because something is spinning. If, if we know the torque, we can predict which way it's going to go. So same way when I'm doing bicycle, so I'm, let's say I'm, 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 do, I'm on my bike, there will be an angular momentum this way. If I lean, there will be a torque because of gravity. And if I know which way that torque is, I can predict that my bike is going to turn this way. So it will matter when we get to angular momentum. I, I, I definitely want to get to that. There is a pop quiz. At what time does it open? 12. So just a, a short application here. So usually women will injure their knees more easily than men. The, the, the meniscus here. That's because, of course, the hip are larger, and you see how it can apply a torque about here, whereas here the force here cannot, the torque cannot uh, damage the knees as much. So a lot of application in the human body and in food.